In ancient Athens, they commemorated their founder Theseus by taking a ship on a pilgrimage to Delos to honor Apollo. A question was raised by philosophers. After several hundred years of maintenance, if each individual piece of the ship of Theseus was replaced, one after the other, was it still the same ship? We can answer that question in the context of electricity transmission, because a new line needs to get approval to connect to the grid, but an existing one already has approval. So this is a legal question which must be answered. Welcome to Decarbonize and the next episode on my series on transmission. Today we're going to talk about upgrading of transmission lines, focusing on reconductoring, which is what it sounds like, taking the transmission line and replacing the cable or conductor with one capable of carrying more power. But we'll also look at other upgrades where everything is replaced except the right-of-way. In the hierarchy of things we can do, reconductoring takes longer and is more expensive than grid enhancement technologies, or GETs, that I talked about in my previous video, but is much easier than building a new line from scratch, which is called greenfield development. But first, why do we need to upgrade the grid? Electrical load grew dramatically from 1950 until 2005, at which time we entered a period of demand stability. But EVs, data centers, heat pumps, and reshoring manufacturing means increased electricity demand. In addition to general growth, the source of our electricity is also changing. The first power plant, the Pearl Street Station in New York City, was a coal-fired dynamo energizing a 100-volt DC system built by Thomas Edison that only worked for customers less than a mile away. Westinghouse introduced an AC system that transmitted power at 500 volts, allowing energy to travel several miles with similar losses. That trend continues to this day, with the ultra-high voltage systems in China operating at between 800 kilovolts and a megavolt, 10,000 times the voltage of Edison's system. So as we decarbonize, even if load wasn't growing, the move from power plants where the fuel is brought to the plant, like coal or natural gas, to power plants located where the fuel is, like wind and solar, puts a new strain on our transmission system. But it's easier to transmit electricity through a wire than an equivalent amount of energy by train or pipeline. So this transition leads to a more efficient system overall. Historically, we've been expanding our transmission network by about 1% per year which doesn't even come close to building the grid we require to meet our electricity production and decarbonization needs. Here we see a model from the Department of Energy on how much transmission we need. The dashed line near the bottom is an extrapolation of what we've been doing historically. Clearly, we need a change in the transmission space if electricity is going to continue to be a driver of our economy. GETS, that I spoke about previously, can help but only a small amount. If a transmission line is congested, that is often running near its load limits, then we may need to upgrade that line with something more capable. When I think of a conductor, copper is what comes to mind. But as was discussed in the episode on mining, aluminum is much more plentiful and is a pretty good conductor. The most common conductor for high voltage power transmission has been the aluminum conductor steel reinforced cable, featuring conductive strands around a steel core. This provides the strength to support the cable. However, these lines are limited to around 75 degrees C. Dynamic line ratings can increase the amount of power these cables carry, but not dramatically. In the last 20 years, several companies have introduced composite core conductors, which can carry up to double the current of the conventional conductors on the same pylons inside the same right-of-way, with only minor changes at the substations. These cables swap the steel core for a smaller, lighter composite core, typically ceramic, glass, or carbon fibers, without compromising structural strength. This means more conductive aluminum, which has been treated to allow it to get hotter, allowing for up to twice the current at the same voltage. Looking at this chart, we see the relative costs of developing new transmission lines versus reconductoring at a variety of voltages. 
At all voltages, reconductoring is much cheaper since just developing the right-of-way, or ROW, is almost as expensive as reconductoring. And the structures are in every case the biggest cost, and those don't need to be upgraded. If gets are insufficient to relieve congestion, reconductoring is a no-brainer. Unless that's not sufficient to resolve the problem. In this chart, we see other upgrades to the transmission line that can increase the power transmitted even more than reconductoring. Each of these moves is significantly more expensive and time consuming to adopt and may not be cost effective. Here I've added the approximate power each line can transmit. For context, an average home uses about a kilowatt of power, so the standard line transmits enough power for about half a million households, while the largest can support about 4 million homes. And here we get back to the ship of Theseus. If reconductoring or increasing the voltage makes this a new line, then the interconnection approval would be lost and the owner of the transmission line would need to reapply for permission to connect to the grid and there's a long backlog in this process, and it can take years. In my Clean the Green video, I talked about the Sioux Green Project, a proposed 2.1 gigawatt HVDC line to connect wind power in Iowa to the grid near Chicago. Their plan to use existing transportation right-of-ways and buried line allowed them to quickly get permissions and permits needed to lay the line, but they have been waiting to get permission to connect to the grid in Illinois for years. But luckily, as far as the grid operator is concerned, reconductoring or increasing the voltage or even moving to high voltage direct current doesn't make it a new line, even if it carries four times as much power. So we have an answer to Theseus's paradox, at least as far as transmission lines go. But reconductoring is not a panacea. If a utility wants to access power from a wind farm, and there are no transmission lines going there, then greenfield development like the Sioux Green Project will be required, which can take up to 20 years. My transmission series will continue by talking about changes by the federal government to speed greenfield development. I'd like to thank the creators of the 2035 and Beyond report on reconductoring. Most of the graphics here came from that report, and I've included a link below. If you've learned something, please like and subscribe. You can also support my channel by buying me a coffee. And if you have any thoughts or questions, please feel free to add a comment. I read them all and respond to most of them. And you're clearly interested in electricity transmission, so you can watch my whole series on that topic here. And please share this video with anyone you know who knows about the ship of Theseus.